Padre's work on topology. It right. Thank you very much. So uh, it's it's really just a great honor to to be able to come to Institute Henri Poincaré to to speak about Poincaré's work on on topology. And well, so whoops. Uh, so so these papers are are Poincaré's uh, Annalise Situs papers. I mean, that's Annalise Situs. That's what they called topology in, in, in those days. And uh, there's, well, there's several Comprendu announcements and, and five papers, but uh, actually six, the original paper and five complements. But Really, the, the hardcore topology and the stuff I'll, I'll mainly talk about is, is in sort of the, the first paper, the first and second and fifth complements. So, so John Morgan, in, in his lecture yesterday, said that, uh, that most, most topologists think of, of Poincaré as sort of the, the founder of topology. And, and and part, part of the goal of this lecture is, is, is to make this argument. Not that he's the first mathematician that, that did sort of impressive results in topology. Rather, Poincaré was really the first person to, well, he really created uh, topology as, as sort of a, a separate subfield, separate field of mathematics, a field which has its own internal problems and, and issues. But, but Poincaré I mean, demonstrated that, that, that topology is a field that gets a lot of input and inspiration from other fields of mathematics and science, and in turn gives a lot of, sort of contributions to, to other subjects. So, uh, so John, yesterday, sort of gave some, some hints about what, what topology is. And well, I think I'm just uh, re refrained from, uh, well, from, from giving sort of a, a, a formal definition. But rather, I'd, 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 I'd like sort of Poincaré in, in his own words to, to, to tell us rather not the technical definition of what topology is, but sort of what it sort of sort of what, what its, its structure is. So, so uh, in, in the in introduction to his first paper, he says, geometry, in fact, has a unique raison d'etre as the immediate description of the structures which underline our senses. It is above all the analytic study of a group. Consequent, consequently, there is nothing to prevent us from proceeding to study other groups which are analogous but more general. So I think what he's saying is that, that, that he was looking at, at well, he, before he had the study of Fuchsian groups, he was, he was looking at, at these very s special things. And, and, and Fuchsian groups are you know, the groups underlying, say, hyperbolic geometry, the non-Euclidean geometry, the, the plane. And, and now he, he recognized that there's really other groups which describe sort of some more general objects, manifolds. So, uh, but then he makes this statement, which I really like, is he says, perhaps these reasons are not sufficient in themselves. It is not enough, in fact, for a science to be legitimate. Its utility must be incontestable. So many objects depend, demand our attention that only the most important have the right to be considered. So, and, and then he goes further and, and gives some uh, some, some examples of, of why it's important to, to, to study topology. But I'd, I'd like actually to quote, uh, which actually uh, John paraphrased ye yesterday, but just give the direct quote from, from this other paper, which he, he wrote in, in 1901, which was sort of a summary of, of, of his scientific works. And he says, it has been said that I have written in the preface to Analysis Cetus, which he did, uh, that geometry is the art of reasoning well with badly made figures. Yes, without doubt, but with one condition. 
The proportions of the figures might be grossly altered, but their elements must not be interchanged, must conserve their relative situation. In other words, one does not worry about qualitative properties, but one must respect the qualitative properties, sorry, one must not worry about quantitative properties, but one must respect the qualitative re properties. That is to say precisely those which are the concern of analysis situs. So, uh, right, and right, and then he go, mentions that, uh, that there was a early stuff studied by Riemann and, and Betty, but no one really has followed up on, on their works. So, and now here he gives this long, just incredible reason which drove him to think about topology. He says, well, as for me, all the diverse paths which I was successfully engaged in led me to analyst situs. And he goes on and on. Finally, I glimpsed in analyst situs a means of attacking an important problem in the theory of groups, the search for discrete or finite groups contained in a given continuous group. It is for all these reasons that I've devoted to this science a fairly long work. So, uh, right. So, so that, that was sort of the, the, the introduction. And before I go on and, and talk about what Poincaré actually did, I, I want to just give you an idea of, of what the, the state of topology was bef before Poincaré. So this, this is sort of the first page of, of Euler's uh, famous paper on the bridges of Konigsberg. And actually, this is sort of a, a picture in that paper where the, the, the problem is, well, here, here is uh, whoops. Uh, here is here is like the, the the city, and it was sort of think of it being in four parts. And and the question was, can you can you sort of just take a walk starting at one spot and and just go over all the seven bridges without going over a bridge twice? And uh, and Euler uh, sort of solved that problem, and maybe that was the first serious result in topological type argument. So, uh, so Euler also discovered the, the Euler characteristic. And uh, Gauss discovered this idea of linking numbers. So you have these two curves that, that, that so somehow to measure how much they, they go one around the other. Of course, he did this spectacular Gauss-Binet theorem, which, which found sort of a connection between geometry of the surface and its Euler characteristic. Uh, Riemann, uh, well, he introduced the idea of, of, of a manifold and uh, in, in general, sort of, but in practice, he, he just looked at the, the two-sphere and looked at really branched covers. But for surfaces, he had this measure of, of how complicated the surface was. He called it the order of, of connectivity, how many cuts you need to chop a surface up into a disk. And then there was Listing, who discovered the Mobius band and actually coined the word topology, although topology is spelled in English, was first used by Peter Tate in his obituary. Well, Mobius independently discovered the Mobius band. Uh, Cayley and Maxwell independently discovered this idea that if you have an island, then uh, then if you look at the sort of the high points and sort of the low points and, and sort of the saddles, they sinks minus the saddles plus the sum uh, equals one. And, uh, and then there was this, this uh, Jordan curve theorem, which said that if you have like a closed curve in the plane, it separates into two pieces. Uh, there are various works in, in knot theory. And, uh, and then there was a very influential work by Betty, which sort of tried to generalize what Riemann did to sort of higher dimensions. But all, all these, the, these, these works, and this is really summarizes this, you know, the, the whole extent of, of knowledge of topology uh, be, before uh, Poincaré's works. I mean, they're sort of very you know, interesting, isolated results, but, but not really you know, part of a, a general theory. So, so now, right, so now I'd like to just say uh, some things about, well, what did, what did Poincaré do in his foundational paper, which actually was preceded by, by two announcements? Well, to start with, 
Well, he, 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 well, he just actually gives a little sharper definition of, of manifold, which was just along the lines that Betty and Riemann did. But another thing which actually John Morgan mentioned yesterday was this sort of, you know, the, the current, I, I mean, well, the standard definition now of a manifold is just being built up by, by, by charts, by pieces. I mean, that sort of is an innovation in, in, in this, this paper. He, he defines this notion of orientation. Well, actually, or, the idea of orientation existed earlier, but you, you, using sort of the determinants, so uh, to, between the transition maps. Of course, the spectacular contribution of defining the f fundamental group. So if you're given a, a, a manifold, then associated to that is the, this a group, the, the fundamental group. And, and he defines it both sort of as a group of covering transformations of universal cover and in, generated in terms of, of loops. And this itself is quite revolutionary because uh, previous to this, to to topological things, there's just sort of numbers, there's invariance. But here he's associating a group. Now he defines this idea of uh, be Betty number, which, well, it's, it's the, in this form, it was one plus the maximum number of the, whoops, well, sorry, that P should be a K. The Kth Betty number is one plus the maximum number of K dimensional orientable submanifolds. So that the, over the integers, these submanifolds are homologically independent. So in other words, if you just, if you just take some, some linear copy, copies of this one and copies of that one, copies of that one, and if they all bound a manifold of one higher dimension, that's, uh, that's, that's what a homology is. He, well, more or less, in modern words, he recognized that homology, H1, is the abelianization of pi1. He defines this idea of algebraic intersection number and, and shows that if, so, so if you have a, a manifold of dimension 5 and a manifold of dimension 3, living in a manifold of dimension 8, they'll intersect in points, and, but rather than just counting the number of points, count the number of points with signs, and you get a number which which if you just take the intersection of M and N versus N and M, they differ by a certain sign. And, and these, these intersection numbers are invariant under homology. And I should say this, for, for those of you who aren't mathematicians, these are just incredibly fundamental concepts that, that it's just amazing that just in one paper that, that they're, they're, they're introduced. Uh, he, he uses, uses integration theory to, to distinguish uh, uh, homology classes, generalizing methods of, of Betty. He gives really interesting examples of manifolds. I mean, the, the examples that, that existed through Betty, through, through Klein and his students were not really too exciting. But I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing that he just, for example, looked at, at torus bundles over the circle. Um, and, and of course, he had a spectacular, well, all this stuff is spectacular, but the, the, this Poincare duality theorem that, that says that if you have a manifold of dimension n, then the Betty numbers that are, in his words, that are sort of equidistant from n, uh, the kth Betty number and the n minus the kth Betty number, those are, those are equal. And well, he thought about this because he had some Intuitive, well, to him, sort of, he had this idea that as, uh, a class was homologically trivial if and only its algebraic intersection number with uh, classes of complementary dimension were, were trivial. And I should say he was very much inspired by uh, Picard, who noted that, that the first and third Betty numbers were equal for complex surfaces. So, right. Uh, he defined this idea of cellulation, which, I mean, was very similar to, uh, I mean, this idea of you just take, take some, some, some space and, and you sort of to decompose it into cells. I mean, that was just a variation of an existing theme, but, but a very important sort of psychological way of, of, of looking at things. Of course, the, the famous euler poincare characteristic relating the classical Euler characteristic is the alternating sum of, of, of Betty numbers. 
So, so in this one paper, just this just incredible, truly incredible, uh, just one after another, just absolutely fundamental, seminal ideas. So I'd like to mention a, a quotation of Darbo in his, in his eulogy. He said, I saw Poincaré at the Sorbonne, the Bureau des Longitudes at the Academy. Whenever asked to solve a problem, his answer came with the speed of an arrow. When he wrote a memoir, he wrote but a single draft, making a few changes without returning to what he had written. I should say, I made a serious attempt to, to read Poincaré's paper. And, and I, I believe what, what Darbo says is true. <laughs> and, but this is actually, to me, a very interesting point, that his writing style might have been so just, 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 you know, just fast, just one go. But his, his, his working style, completely different. And I'll try to say, just by quoting his own words, that he, he, he constantly came back and rethought about sort of central issues. And, and you'll see in the case of topology that each time he sort of rethought the subject, it's just incredible, sort of the, the, the new uh, you know, break, breakthroughs that he was doing. So, uh, well, Dudonet was, was a little bit more direct. He said, it is often necessary to guess what he had in mind by interpreting the context. For many results, hardly a single argument does not raise doubts. The paper is really a blueprint for future developments of entirely new ideas, each of which demanded the creation of a new technique to put it on a sound basis. So, uh, well, I mean, just have a list of, th list of things here. I mean, for example, this idea of just thinking of, of classes as, uh, as sub-manifolds. Well, that's actually a very delicate issue that took I mean, there's really sophisticated algebraic topology and was finally sorted out by Rene Tom in 54. As far as using integration to, uh, to, to un understand uh, cl classes, well, I, I can't do better than quoting sort of the anonymous author of the, the Samer in volume six of, of Poincaré's collected works, where he said, uh, Punk paragraph seven introduces cohomology. He posed problems that Elie Cartan explained, and George Durham resolved. So the famous Durham theorem, which, which relates sort of the, the Durham cohomology, cohomology based on, on forms with, uh, with cohomology based on uh, in, 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 in real coefficients. And anyway, uh, Cartan sort of inspired by what Poincaré wrote, sort of conjectured these uh, Durham Theor conjectures which Durham proved. Anyway, there's also other things, topological invariance homology. So this business with intersection numbers, well, uh, to really put that on a firm foundation, you, you really have to understand sort of general position, which was done by Whitney. And of course, incidentally, Whitney uh, proved this embedding theorem, which showed that actually all the manifolds that Poincaré considered are actually just takes care of all the, really, all the manifolds. So, uh, so, so Hagar, in his 1898 thesis, well, he had some complaints too. And in particular, he noted that, that RP3 was a counterexample to Poincaré duality because the first Betty number is one, the second Betty number is two. Now, uh, so in, in a comp one due paper of 1899, well, Poincaré uh, responded to that by pointing out that, that his definition of Betty number is actually different than Betty's definition of Betty number. And well, uh, well, the first approximation, well, definitely his Betty number was just a rank of, of homology and Q coefficients, while Betty, Betty's number was approximately the, well, to some extent, the, the first approximation, the rank of, of just in Z coefficients. So in particular, uh, for RP3, and rationally, it's, it's, it's just the homology is just trivial in dimensions one and two, while in, well, in, in Z coefficients, of course, we know that Betty number is one and uh, the second Betty number is two. But going from Betty to Poincaré, just looking at Betty numbers, Poincaré had this huge you know, breakthrough where he was 
allowing to sort of add and subtract and, and divide homologies by, by integers, which, well, and today we think of that, I mean, that's just uh, sort of in, in rational coefficients. But this is Hagar's objection, but I, I call it a gift because Hagar was really the first person to, to really look at, um, at, at what Poincaré did. And, and I should say that, that Poincaré, to his credit, he could have just blown off Betty by just this I'm oh, sorry, by Hagar, just, just sort of dismissed Hagar by saying, Hagar, look, you, you misunderstood what my definition of Betty number was. But, but Poincaré took this as an opportunity just to sort of the rethink the whole subject. And, uh, right. So, so then he just quickly followed up with the first and second compliments. So here's a quotation from the introduction of the second one. He says, nevertheless, the question, that is, topology, is far from being exhausted. And I shall doubtless be forced to return to it several times. This time, I shall confine myself to certain considerations that are likely to simplify, clarify, and complement the previous results. So, uh, so in, in this one, he, he, he really just goes back and just, just really drops this idea of, of homology classes being represented by manifolds and introduces what, what we, we now have the standard thing of like uh, simplicial homology. And so, so in particular, if you have a space, it's built up by cells. Say there's, there's I, uh, CI I cells and CI minus one, I minus one cells. Then he, he recognized how to compute the homology by just taking boundary because he, un, he sort of understood uh, orientation, boundary orientation from his first paper. And, and therefore, the boundary operator is the CI minus 1 times CI matrix. And, and then just by you know, elementary linear algebra, then the ith Betty number is, is just the number of I cells minus the rank of the, the, the ith boundary operator minus the uh, rank of the I plus first um, matrix. So, 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 so therefore, there's this, this, this nice, clean definition of, 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 of homology. And, and, and therefore, he just gets really clean proof of, of the Euler-Poincaré formula, because these, you know, when you're taking the alternating sum, well, you, you can see that the number of, of cells, the alternating sum of the cells, which is just what Euler's definition is, well, in, in the low dimension case, is. Uh, I mean, these, these BIs, they just, you know, just cancel each other out. And, and in this paper, he recognized that there's, 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 there's the, the torsion part. And what well, I should just do, do a little side point is that it's interesting that, that although Poincaré introduced the fundamental group, the first time a group is, is associated as, as, an, as, as, an, as something, as an invariant of a, of a manifold, Nevertheless, he, he and, and for the next 10 years, some very talented top-level topologists thought about homology not as, as a group, which we do now, but in terms of just in, in numbers and torsion numbers and uh, Betty numbers. And, and, and she just made this just uh, very simple observation, which just psychologically changed the way people thought and just really just really a big advance, which was that they should just think of these things as, uh, as, 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 as groups. So, uh, right, and there's sort of certain things that had to be cleaned up later, you know, uh, going from uh, smooth to PL and uh, invariance of, 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 of these as, as, as topological invariants. And then uh, Poincaré goes on to just, again, completely fundamental ideas, which are uh, the idea of baricentric subdivision, star of vertex, dual cellulation. Anyway, uh, well, I mean, to, if you're a topologist, you recognize this picture where there's the black, which is the, uh, say, the, the original cellulation, and there's the, the, the red, which is the, I mean, the, so the dual cellulation, and uh, so these are two different cellulations of this, the same manifold, but they both sort of subdivide to the barycentric <laughs> subdivision. And uh, anyway, staring at this picture and thinking about it, you, 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 get, the, you get a sort of a clean proof of, well, at least in the simplicial world, of, of Poincaré duality. 
And um, well, and then here it's he, he sort of announces his, his first version of uh, of of the Poincaré conjecture that he thought that that if you have a, a manifold and all its Betty numbers, well, in, in, in the middle, in, in the, except for the top and bottom dimension, are, are zero, then, then the manifold's a sphere. And I should say, actually, this idea goes back to Riemann, the idea of if you have a manifold, try, try to find some invariance that, that just, just determine that uh, sort of uniquely. And, and, and one of his big motivations was in, with these torus bundles. Those were examples of manifolds which had, had the same Betty numbers, but were different manifolds. And uh, so, so this is sort of, again, a, 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 you know, searching for the right sort of uh, criterion. So, uh, right. So, so now let me just go to the, to the fifth complement. So again, in the introduction, he says, I now return to the same question, persuaded that one can come to the end only by repeated efforts, and it's important and sufficient to justify further effort. This time, I confine myself to the study of certain three-dimensional manifolds, but the methods used without doubt are of more general applicability. So, of course, this is the famous paper where he, he entered, you know, finally, after sort of this long process, you know, gives the right you know, form of the, of the Poincaré conjecture. Ignoring that, this is just an incredible paper. And uh, I mean, that in this paper, he, he basically uh, you know, you know, def creates the Morse theory and handle body theory. And uh, well, so, so in Morse theory, you, you, you have a manifold, and you have like a function from that manifold to the real numbers. And, and that's a way of sort of like slicing up the of the manifold using this function. Think of it like some type of height function, but but there's certain singularities, and in the Morse theory, well, you you, you show there's certain the function can be realized so that the singularities are all of, of certain types, and in which you can then build up the manifold by just understanding these singularities. And I mean, what's incredible is is, is all of that is in this paper. <coughs> So, so here you can't read it, but uh, there's, well, it, it, it's it's really it's it's right there. I mean, well, if I could actually make it bigger, uh, just just incredible. I mean, because well, I don't know. Maybe it's the French education. Yeah, every, everyone knows this, but uh, but but uh, you know, to me, I was just totally shocked to see this. I mean, right, right here, it basically says that you have, a, have a, this, this height function on, on, on this manifold. First, you make a perturbation. Then you change the coordinates. And this function looks like a quadratic function. It's, it's exactly you know, you know, Mor Morse theory. So, um, and OK, so now if I, right. And, 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 and then sort of here's you know, like, here's like the standard picture of sort of the you know index one singularity on, on a surface. Anyway, that just that's a, and so when he in his introduction where he says this stuff will have more applicability to to, to higher other you know, higher dimensions. Well, this is exactly was sort of Smale's starting point for for proving the you know the high dimensional Poincaré conjecture. So uh, right. So uh, anyway. So, so Morse and Morse didn't actually come out and say this isn't Morse theory. This is you know, Poincaré theory, but he does in, in the introduction to to his, uh, his his book, the Calculus of Variations. He, he gives sort of a clear acknowledgement to, to Poincaré. So just just so um, so he says at some point such conceptions are not due to the author. It will be sufficient to say that Henri Poincaré was among the first to have a conscious theory of macroanalysis. And of all mathematicians, was doubtless the one who most effectively put such a theory into practice. So, okay, so that's the more. So here's sort of other results from the uh, from this fifth complement. He he recognized that you could there's a symplectic form, and you could use that to compute algebraic intersection number. He, he had a criterion for showing when a homology class is represented by a simple closed curve. Another criterion for when a homology 
when, for a, when a simple closed curve, sorry, gives another criterion when a homotopy class is, is, is realized by a simple curve. And this to, this to me, he just, just says this just casually in a couple of lines. Really incredible. So he just says, well, you take a curve, just homotopic to a, to a geodesic, lift it to the universal cover. And if you just see that these, these are all just disjoint curves, just assuming it's sort of not a, a power, then this is, it's, gonna be a, it's, it's, it's simple. On the other hand, if you homotop it to a geodesic and you see in the universal cover that these things are crossing, then it's, it's not going to be simple. That is, it, it crosses itself downstairs. And I mean, to me, this is really incredible because the fact is for him to make this statement means that he must have known. I mean, just says, he says these things as if it's obvious, but he must, it means that he really understood this idea that if you, have, you take something, you do a homotopy, well, that sort of look, might be, look like a radical change in the surface, but the homotopy is, is going to just nevertheless, you know, give, you know, you start with this curve, you do some crazy homotopy, you're still going to get some other curve which has these same endpoints at infinity. So this is probably the first time that the topology of infinity of hyperbolic space is used to uh, do, uh, to, uh, do topological stuff. Uh, anyway, he just showed how to compute fundamental group. Again, this is, I mean, there's really, I mean, this is just a, you know, the primal form of the well-known ciphered Van Kampen theorem. Of course, then there's the his famous thing of, of, of showing the Poincaré homology sphere, this, the sphere which is counterexample to his, uh, is, is rich, earlier form of, of, of the Poincaré conjecture. Of course, the famous picture of the, of the Poincaré homology sphere. And the final statement of, of the, the Poincaré conjecture. Actually, just an aside, you know, he, he states so the Poincaré conjecture, so this one question remains to be dealt with. Is it possible for the fundamental group of this manifold to reduce the identity without being simply connected? Then he just gives some more explanation. And then the last statement of the paper is, however, this question will take us too far. Now, uh, you know, I've, I never understood what does that mean? So, but, you know, I have my computer, I have volume six, thousand pages. So I said, okay, well, why not just give this a shot? And so I just, you know, just type in on, on the sort of the find feature, I type in, uh, you know, the, you know, on tron array tro loin. And I get one hit, and it comes up with that expression is actually used in uh, in chapter seven of of analysis where he he uses sort of that same expression except sort of he says these conditions are quite easy to construct that would take me too far away from my subject so if he really meant the same thing here as as there then and I think what he meant was that, well, whatever he, more thoughts he had on the subject was really a little distracting from the content of this paper. So anyway, this, again, just incredible, amazing things that, and fundamental seminal ideas, just independent of not including what he did about the Poincaré conjecture. So, so that sort of summarized his Annalise C2's papers. But what he did in topology is just outside of that, just amazing. I mean, there's. Uh, he, he had a, this is just, just thinking just purely in terms of functions, but I mean, the modern way of constructing universal covering space of, of, a, of, a, of, a, map, of, a, of a topological space in terms of equivalence classes of, of paths, well, that, that appeared in some paper in 1883. Uh, the Poincare Hopf index formula for cal calculating, showing the Euler characteristic of a surface could be relayed in terms of, of vector fields. Well, he, well, I mean, he did that for surfaces, and Hoff got his name somehow because 30 years later he proved the same theorem in, in high, higher dimensions. Well, he had this theorem about the degree one maps. Well, the idea of degree one didn't exist then, but he had a, a map of a sphere which, ha, which, well, somehow mapping anyway. So he had he had proved something a version like that in, in, in this. Um, so he, he of course he computed understood isometries, hyperbolic space, and had his, had his models, which are just completely fundamental, of course, to you know, modern day hyperbolic geometry. Now I'd just like to mention just, just his dimension theory, where in this, uh, in, in this philosophy paper, he, 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 he introduces, he asks the question of, well, why is three-dimensional space three-dimensional? And 
from the point of view of sort of, well, a coordinates to us, well, it seems obvious it's three-dimensional. From the point of view of just as sort of as, as a smooth manifold, well, you do a diffeomorphism in modern day, we have the, its dimensions because of the tangent space and a smooth manifold's rank preserving. So, but, but on the other hand, should it really be three dimensions? Because Cantor had observed that if you look at three dimensional space, I mean, it has really has the same number of points as the circle, which is one dimensions. So what intrinsic about three dimensional space makes it three dimensional instead of one dimensional? And well, then he makes this incredible statement. He says, I will base the determination of the number of dimensions on the notion of cut. Now, I'm sure this one sentence just changed the lives of, of just a bunch of people in, you know, in, in, in his day. Because, because this, this, this idea of, well, I mean, if you, basically, you know, you're saying you have, you have a, why is three-dimensional space three-dimensional? Because you take a point in a little neighborhood, well, it's a, the boundary of that neighborhood's a sphere. Well, that's two-dimensional. Why is that? Because if you have a point on the sphere, you take a little neighborhood of that, the boundary of that's a circle. And that's, well, that's, a circle is one-dimensional. And why is that? Because if you have a point on the circle, a little neighborhood of that's two discrete points. And discrete points are zero-dimensional. Anyway, he just says that sort of casually. But this sort of, you know, right away, Brower just tried to get sort of a more sort of mathematical definition. Well, that is mathematical, actually, what he said. But, which was more, more ultimately formulated by maybe Menger and Eurozone, maybe 10 years after that. But this you know, it's huge, well, subfield of mathematics based on this dimension theory. So, uh, so let me just mention that you know, it's just incredible what Poincaré did in, in topology. And yet, of, of, well, as I mentioned in, you know, in the very beginning, I, I quoted from the introduction. That was about, a, took up, well, like a full page of, of, of Poincaré's study, well, view of his own view of his own scientific works, which was 100 pages, about 100 pages. And so of the, those 100 pages, about three and a half pages were devoted to, to topology. Those three and a half pages, he felt the need to spend uh, like a full page just explaining why he's, he'd want to do this stuff. And so you, you might say, well, that doesn't seem like very much. And, but, you know, Poincaré actually, you know, offers a disclaimer for, for why you shouldn't be sort of overwhelmed by these numbers. And sort of as an introduction, well, just two, a little two-page O lecture uh, paper written by Mittag Luffler, who sort of solicited this paper from Poincaré. He says, well, in the letter I wrote, which he agreed to my request, he wrote characteristically of his powerful capacity for work and activity. Poincaré wrote, I would point out that there is the disadvantage that too much time will elapse between when the proofs are returned and the publication is given, making the record seem more complete than it actually is. So, um, right. So, so, so the next thing is, so I, I want to say, say a few words about Poincaré's sort of influence in, 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 in topology. Well, of course, the influence was just, just overwhelming, just in the, in the Poincaré conjecture, the stuff that it, the, the mathematics that it led to in, in, in high dimensions, low dimensions, work in hyperbolic geometry. But in, independent of, of that, there's just an in, in, incredible amount of, of, of work that, that these papers sort of stimulated. And of course, there's the famous Poincaré question, Poincaré conjecture question, but, but, but here's, uh, sort of three, three questions that he asked from his analysis C2 paper. It says, it would be interesting to treat the following questions. One, given a group defined by a number of, of, well, basically he says, given a finally presented group, does it correspond to a, a manifold of n dimensions? And if so, how would you create that manifold? And, and three is, if you have two manifolds of the same dimension, which have the same fundamental group, are they always homeomorphic? These questions will require difficult study and long development. I, have, I will not say more here. So, but, uh, so, so these were in his 1895 paper. Now, I should say that, oh, well, that's the English version. Now, if you, take, if you just take these questions literally, the answers are, are relatively simple. In fact, uh, 
in fact, Cameron Gordon noted that uh, Pankaj himself could have answered question three because these S2 cross test two and S4 are different manifolds, the same, the same dimension four, but, but they, have, uh, they both have trivial fundamental groove. And, and there's also sort of relatively simple, I mean, clever, but, but, but simple examples, in particular for, for question one. Given any group, you could find, and any dimension bigger or equal to four, you could find a closed oriented, four, oriented manifold of that dimension which has that group. So every group is realized by all manifolds of, of dimensions bigger than or equal to four. But I'd like to take this point of view, is that, that Poincaré, you know, he, 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 you know, he did stuff, and he sort of rethought it, rethought it, re refined it, understood it better. So I don't think that we should be frozen in 1895 with sort of the statement of, of these questions, rather that with the sort of the you know, increased sophistication that, that these questions really should have evolved appropriately. So, and if you just, just, just modify them just a, t a tiny bit to put it in sort of a more modern sort of understanding, then, then these uh, questions are, are just, well, there's, uh, they're, they're only at, at best sort of partially understood. And, but in, in particular, uh, this, this question three of does the group determine the, the manifold? Well, if you, uh, if you restrict to, to manifolds of which have the property that all the higher homotopy groups are, are trivial, that's also known as aspherical, and you allow yourself sort of a, a weaker condition of what's known as homotopy equivalence, then, then Whitehead in the 40s noted that, that, that manifolds with the sa which are aspherical, same fundamental group, in fact, are, are, are homotopy equivalent. And uh, so the, these, the, these aspherical manifolds include sort of a wide class. But if you, if you take the question three of does the group determine the manifold and then restrict yourself to aspherical manifolds, well, this is what's now known as the, the Borel conjecture. That is, uh, closed aspherical manifolds with uh, the same fundamental group are, are homeomorphic or sort of indifference sort of just you know, form. It's what's also known as topological rigidity of, of aspherical manifolds. So just said another way, I mean, what does the Poincaré conjecture say? It says that if you have, say, a three-sphere and you have another manifold, which, well, is, is homotopic to that. So if you have a, a, th a three-sphere and, and another manifold homotopy equivalent to that, then the Poincaré conjecture says that this manifold really is the three-sphere. So you could just say the same exact thing if you have a, a manifold which is aspherical, another one, the same homotopy type, or has the same group, then, then, the, then the Borel conjecture is, is that, in fact, they're, they're, they're the same. And this, this, this has led to just so tremendous amount of, of, of mathematical activity. Of course, Poincaré knew this in dimension two. Uh, the, the famous Mosdal rigidity theorem says that if, 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 if both those manifolds were, were hyperbolic, then in fact, they, they, you, could, you could homotopic to an isometry. And then, uh, and that's, that's a, well, theorem is true of in, in, in all dimensions, bigger than or equal to three. And uh, in, in high dimensions, there's sort of a, a sharper form of this Mosdow rigidity due to Farrell and Jones, and, and very recently, uh, Bartels and Luke sort of generalize the, the, the Mostel and then Farrell-Jones theorem to grow up hyperbolic groups and cat zero groups. So, uh, but actually just as an aside, let me mention that, that you could sharpen this question a little bit further is that if you, if you have two uh, homotopy equivalent manifolds and you have a homeomorphism, how unique is that homeomorphism? And well, certainly you need at least unique up to isotopy and in low dimensions, uh, at least dimension three, it's, it's, it's true that, that, that two homotopic homeomorphisms are isotopic. But so this is interesting. In high dimensions, it's actually false that, that you, could have, uh, you could have a homeomorphism of, of a hyperbolic manifold to itself, but the, the isometry homotopic to it could, could not, very well not be isotopic. And, and that's, that could happen in dimensions 
10 and higher now. So that was, so, so question three is, 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 is very open for in many contexts. And, uh, and so, okay, that's, that's just a situation there. And now here's, here's a formulation of, of question one, which remember question one is, given a group, is it the group of a manifold? Well, if you uh, restrict your attention to, to, sort of a, to manifolds, which again have, have this asphericity property, then, then again, this is, is something that's just stimulates this tremendous amount of, uh, of, of work. And uh, well, it's maybe it's, it's, it's known, whoops, known as, as, uh, as, as the wall conjecture, that, that basically these Poincare duality groups, these, these, if you have a group that, that when now you look at from the point of view of, well, uh, a complex which has somehow given a group, you could find some topological space which has that as the fundamental group. And if that space has, well, has certain properties, then that group is called a Poincare duality group. And those are the groups that are candidates for being groups of aspherical manifolds. So, so this is, I call this sort of the modern form of, of, of Poincare's sort of first question. And uh, so, so again, this, this is now known in, in, in dimension, uh, for Poincare, in dimension two. And it's ready for dimension three. It's, um, it's, it's still very much not known. And there's been a huge amount of uh, work in, in this progress, in, in this direction. But it's, it's been a uh, you know, consequence of uh, if you have a group which satisfies certain properties that you can do various things, well, basically it's all been reduced now to two uh, interesting problems, which are the, the weak hyperbolization conjecture, which is whether these PD3 groups are, are hyperbolic in the sense of, of Gromov. And um, well, assuming they have sort of some, uh, just, you know, they're, they're what's known as atroidal. And then this other thing, which is the, the canon conjecture, which is a very interesting conjecture, which you have a, a group, which which some sense, again, you look at its boundary, like Poincare was doing in, in the fifth complement, and if that boundary is, is a two-sphere, then this group is actually the group of a, well, well, if it's, if it's torsion-free, then it's the group of a hyperbolic three-manifold. So this is an extremely interesting question, which, which, is, which is basically saying that you have a group of, of such and such type. Can you actually sort of uniformize it? And, uh, and there's been various partial results. And maybe just, just point out this, this result of, of Kleiner and, and Bonk which is that if, if you have a space, well, there, in certain circumstances, the answer is yes. If, if the certain space satisfies what's known as like a, a certain Poincare inequality. So, um, right. So, so just, uh, I just want to just, just briefly just indicate just a, a direct consequence of Poincare's uh, initial paper and topology already. There's these these very interesting questions that are just you know, very open. And so anyway, this, this, um, the, for, if, you, if you want to learn more about Poincare's work on, on topology, there's, there's really a lot of really great resources. Uh, I mean, and I should thank, I just had a, a huge amount of help in preparing this lecture from uh, Michelle Boileau and, and John Stilwell. And, um, and, and most of the translations were, were direct from uh, Stilwell's papers on, well, it's not his papers, but it's, uh, it's he translated the, the analyst Cetus into five supplements to English and gave some, some annotation. And where I, and there's Sarkaria sort of did, did one of the an intro, paragraphs in the introduction and, and, and Google Translate helped out a little bit too. So, Anyway, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions now. Is a question here? No. Okay, you get the. Uh... Yeah, in uh, in your introduction, you uh, you show briefly the uh, the notice of Poincaré on this motivation for analysis situs. 
And uh, in that, there, is a, there was one big motivation, which was to understand more the differential equation in the three-body problem, and also the, uh, the disturbing function in the planetary problem. And these were very, he was very much uh, motivated for the uh, expansion of this perturbing function, which involved very complicated uh, algebraic equations. So, so he had a very concrete problem to solve, and, my question, and a difficult problem. So my question is uh, whether, uh, uh, how much this count in, uh, in the success of his development, the fact that he has this very difficult problem to solve. That, that I, I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, clearly he was... I, 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 I don't know. You certainly covered a lot of territory there. Uh, last minute chance. Question? No. Okay. Well, let's let's thank uh, David. Goodbye again. <laughs>